Our studio here in New York City, I'm Josh Lipton here with Jared Blickery. This is Yahoo Finance Live. Here's what we're watching this afternoon. We're an hour away now from the close on Wall Street and markets are mixed on the heels of inflation data and the start of peak earnings season. Wholesale inflation unexpectedly falling in December, raising bets that the Fed's first rate cut will be in March. And on the earnings front, a tough start to the reporting season. Banks kicking things off today, mostly disappointing pointing Wall Street expectations and guidance from Delta weighing on the broader airline sector. We're going to be breaking down the results and look at what moves you can make with your portfolio. Plus, oil prices rising, but off earlier highs as the U.S. and U.K. launch dozens of airstrikes in Yemen overnight. We look at the implications of the rising tensions for global supply chain and inflation. All right, let's get you up to speed quickly here on market action. If you look at stocks, basically trending flat right here, slightly down. The Dow's down about 160 points. You can see there the broad gauge, the S&P 500, is basically flat. The NASDAQ is down about, let's see, about a tenth of a percent right now. Of course, investors have a lot to think over today. Big bank earnings. Um, also, we had United Health. That report and reaction weighing on the Dow here. Some inflation news we got today, too. Wholesale prices unexpectedly declining by 0.1% in December. Of course, that followed uh, that modestly hotter than expected CPI print we got yesterday. Major averages on track here for modest gains on the week. Jared, over to you, my friend, for a deeper dive. Thank you. We are looking at some small losses today, uh, but we are looking at gains for the week. And let's just chart those real quick. We got the Dow just barely holding on to green territory, up about two tenths of a percent for the week. You can see some small choppy sideways action there for most of the week. And the NASDAQ is the outperformer. That's up three percent. And just digging into the markets today, energy has been has been a leader all day long. That's on a raise, a rise in the conflagration uh, and the closing of places around the Middle East especially in the Red Sea, shipping lanes under pressure there. You can see energy up about 1%. Followed by real estate and utilities. That's interesting because these two interest rate sensitive sectors uh, have been leaders in the last 10 days or so. Also, communication services, tech, and consumer staples in the green. To the downside, it's consumer discretionary. That would be retail. That is down about one and a third percent. And looking inside the NASDAQ here, we got some outperformers and underperformers. Tesla, we're going to be talking a lot about that, dropping prices in China, also facing uh, Hertz, releasing a lot of their inventory into the uh, ecosystem. System. That's down 4%. Apple down just slightly. Microsoft of about eight tenths of a percent. But let's take a quick look at the bank earnings. We're going to be delving into those in a second. Wells Fargo down 3%. BlackRock here up 4%, $10 trillion under management now. We're going to be talking about that. And I did mention that energy was the leading sector today. We can see ExxonMobil up over 1%. So is Chevron. Schlumberger up 2%. And let me just get a quick check on the crypto markets. Guess what? It was kind Kind of a sell the news event yesterday. Bitcoin down about 7% since we got that uh, ETF green lighted over at the SEC. So we'll be tracking that, guys. We sure will. Now, for a deeper dive on today's bank earnings and what they mean for investors, let's welcome in Dave Ellison, Hennessy Funds Portfolio Manager. Dave, it is great to see you here today and help us kind of make sense of these bank earnings. You know, so you've had a few hours here, kind of make sense of the reports, Dave. I'm interested, kind of, what your big takeaway is. Did the core fundamentals you saw today, Dave, did they basically kind of track what you expected? I think pretty much, yeah, there's really been no surprises, which is probably a good thing, because usually in banks, uh, the surprises are negative, uh, which we saw, you know, last March. So uh, I, I think generally they're they're in line. I think er everybody's looking for some special thing, but it's it's not there. I think, the, you know, the industry's battling through a big rise in rates the last two years, a big shift in, in the yield curve from positive to negative. Obviously, there's issues with uh, commercial real estate office, um, regulatory changes, which usually are negative for them long term, additional capital requirements, and of course, the continued competition from private credit and other sources of capital that are making it hard for them to grow loans. 
I want to ask you about uh, Jamie Dimon's comments about some of the uh, number points in the bet in JP Morgan's earnings and expenses. They have jumped 29 percent to 24 and a half billion dollars. So the banks have to spend more than uh, analysts were, were expecting. Meanwhile, Jamie Dimon has been vocal about uh, being concerned about inflation. Do these things two do these two things tie together? And what's the expense outlook for some of these big banks? Well, I, I, I'm not, you know, expenses are usually an offensive thing. So I don't think you you cut yourself to, uh, you know, a high stock price. So I, I think generally the expenses are reflective of, obviously there's inflation in the industry and these guys have a lot of brick and mortar that they need to take care of. But there is a lot of expenses competing with the onslaught of technology and other areas that are they're trying to compete against so i'm not i think if you're trying to cut expenses you better have a really good reason for it if you're just cutting expenses to make the analysts happy that's a mistake and dave let's just stick with jp morgan there because interesting reversal in the stock today we, we start off higher dave after now we're kind of modestly lower here in today's trade uh seven straight quarters dave of record net interest income you know jp morgan was a winner in 2023 do, do, do you still like it dave here in 2024 you know i do i think i i think the you know i've been following banks since the early 80s and in the early days the small banks were the place to be because that's where the consolidation was that's where the balance sheet repairs were happening when there was a problem there was a lot of problems and then when they got better you made money on the recovery now i think the the bigger banks they you need to have bigger banks to be competitive in the in the market now if you're going to grow loans if you're going to be competitive on wall street if you're going to have any ability to fight through uh, a recession, you've got to be bigger. And I think the fangs have told you that bigger is better. And I think we're moving into that area in the banking industry. So we need to have bigger banks to deal with not only the debt that we have now, but the debt that we're going to have not only in state and federal, but general debt that we're going to have in the system. And so I think bigger is better. That's where the valuations are going to come from, and that's where the stability and the growth is going to come from. So with those with those bigger banks, um, part of that equation would be more assets, more loan growth. Uh, we're seeing that just maybe OK right now. Do you think that has to increase? And then how does that couple with uh, charge offs and delinquencies that we're seeing rising? Well, I think charge offs and delinquencies start with that first. I think that hits everybody. There's no, mm -hmm. there's nothing special about the bank's loans versus all of the other private debt or the private equity or, you know, hedge funds or whatever that are out there that have made debt loans. So I think that affects everybody and it's an economic issue. The issue is whether you're taking share. The banks have lost share through regulatory controls, capital needs the unwillingness to take a lot of risk because of risk-weighted capital requirements. And I think they need to reverse that in some way. But again, you're not going to do that as a small bank. You're going to do that as a bigger bank. And uh, I think longer term loan growth is going to be a problem. But again, the bigger you are, it's going to be easier to solve. So we'll see what happens. And Dave, another specific name I want to get your, your take on is Citi. Um, you know, obviously, you know, announced layoffs today. Not a big surprise there, but undergoing this sort of transformation under CEO Jane, Jane Frazier to get smaller, more streamlined. She actually said, Dave, um, the fourth quarter was disappointing in her, her words. 2024, she said, will be a turning point. What, what are your thoughts on Citi, Dave? Well, Citi's, uh, you know, the stock's done nothing for 10 years. Uh, luckily, I haven't owned it for 10 years, but I've owned it for three or four years. So, you know, thanks to me, I, you know, shareholders haven't benefited at all in my funds. But I, I think generally they have to do something. Hopefully, she'll start to do things that will rationalize what this bank is. It's hard to know what it is now. Hopefully, it will turn into something that has a purpose and a need in the system. And if it gets smaller, great. I think people say, look, it's, you know, it's trading at 60% of book, but what's book value? There's a lot of stuff that needs to be written down and rationalized. But I think longer term, it's one of the big four, big five banks out there. It's needed, it's necessary, it has the size, and I think it will it'll be fine if she can execute on some of these things. So I, I think it's not a bad place to be. 
And finally here, thinking about the Fed and interest rates and the structure of the yield curve right now, uh, it's been inverted with short-term rates higher than long-term rates for roughly eight, a year and a half, depending on how you measure it. Um, what does that need to do going forward to, uh, I guess, to boost bank profits, to ensure that they'll be able to carry out their functions and grow as you think they should? Well, I think, you know, loan growth has been a problem um, and obviously they have, you know, this industry has been forced into no new products, no growth, no innovation because of really what happened in 2008. And that's been a problem on the multiples and the problem on the growth. I think when it comes to the yield curve, you know, everybody wants rates to go down. If the Fed starts to lower rates, the banks are going to start to lower the prime. And that's going to take away whatever energy they have on the rise in asset yields to offset the cost of funds. So I think this year, especially through the first half, it's going to be a, you know, push me, pull you on, on margins. But I think eventually the yield curve will settle out, become positively sloped again, and that's will benefit them. But let's not get too, like, if rates go down as much as the market thinks, was it four or five moves this year? Um, that's a you know a percent and a half. That means a percent and a half off the prime, which will probably hurt just as much as the benefit of the decline in the cost of funds. So, I, I think let, let's. I would hope that rates would stay near where they are now. Maybe we have one cut this year, and that would be better for the banks than having four or five cuts. And Dave, I want to get you out of here on this. Listen, we heard from some, some big banks today, Dave, but we, uh, we're still waiting. We got Goldman and Morgan Stanley on, on deck. Did you hear anything today, Dave, which maybe indicates what you might hear from those two when they report? Well, I think you'll hear pretty much the same stuff. Uh, you, you know, I, I think, you know, these big banks, what, what happens to the goose usually happens to the gander. So, I think generally you're going to hear kind of the same thing. Maybe it's the, these, you know, J.P. Morgan, I mean, Goldman's not a bank like J.P. Morgan and Morgan Stanley is not a bank like Bank America. So there'll be nuances, but I think the industry is in decent shape. The consumer is showing pretty good resilience. It shows that the economy is reasonably strong. So it tells me that the rest of the earnings out there that we're going to see, meaning non-bank earnings, are going to be probably okay. So it's a good indication of what's happening to the economy. We all know that. And I think they're they're telling us the economy is in pretty good shape. Dave, thank you so much for joining us today. Really appreciate that time and insight. Yep, you're welcome. Time now to look at some of today's trending tickers. We're taking a look at the second day of trading. It's a spot Bitcoin ETFs. Uh, so Jerry, we got about a dozen of these spot Bitcoin products. I did hear, um, SEC Chair Gary Gensler on another network this yes. morning. And, and one thing that was interesting there, he, he continued to kind of very much, Jared, make a point of sounding this kind of strong note of caution, right? He, he really wanted to hammer that home. Investors, he said, should know the underlying asset here. He said it's volatile, it said it's speculative. It kind of just highlighted how it, it sort of it yeah. felt to me again, like maybe the SEC got kind of dragged Kicking and stream, kicking and streaming into this one. I, I wish they would use some caution with respect to their Twitter account or X account in securing <laughs> uh, the two-factor authorization. You got to make that next step, guys. Uh, but in all seriousness, um, look, this I think overall, with respect to Gensler, he's. I, this is not a break for him. Uh, I don't think he has been that friendly towards crypto since the very beginning. There were lots of expectations when he was coming in because of that MIT course that he was teaching on blockchain. That's right. That's right. That, oh, this yeah. is going to be the crypto-friendly uh, SEC chart. That did not happen at all. But if we go to the Wi-Fi Interactive, just want to point out something with respect to all these Bitcoin ETFs. Now, this is uh, all the, B the ETFs with Bitcoin exposure I could find. The one in the green up here, that's an inverse ETF. And so this did not launch yesterday. This has been in existence for a while. There are some others in there that don't even have necessary uh, exposure directly to Bitcoin. It's just other blockchain and Bitcoin stocks. But look at this. In the lower right-hand corner, IBIT, that's the BlackRock offering. That's down 10.8%. And then Burr, uh, yeah, that's the Valkyrie. Let's just check out the two-day price action there. Uh, those are significantly underperforming the underlying, and that underlying would be Bitcoin, which is down about 7%. So already we're seeing a lot of fluctuation in the prices. So let me just highlight that one more time. 
11.45% down there. And then you take a look at HODL, that's down 4%. That's a big disparity. Yep. And we're only on day two here. Yeah, it's going to be fast. I'm just, I'm very interested to see how this kind of shakes out yeah. in the near to intermediate term. What kind of, what, you know, what ETF flows look like? Where's the, the demand? Yeah. yeah, is it young crypto fans? Is it, is it retirement accounts? Jeez. Well, and there's a huge uh, structural advantage for GBTC, Grayscale. Yeah. Uh, they're keeping one and a half, a one and a half percent fee, and yeah, they already right, have the assets right. under management. We'll see if some of us, we'll see if they lose market share. All right, we got to move on to Delta Airlines. They are topping expectations for the fourth quarter, but share sliding after the company trims its profit forecast. And uh, this is a case that fares are weakening, which is not necessarily translating into higher costs. Um, pilot costs rose by 23%. And here's a stat. They, they got a 15% increase in traffic, led to 12% more revenue, but a decline by uh, 190 basis points in operating margins. So uh, a little bit of, of trouble they're passing off those higher costs to the consumers, the passengers, uh, and that's just been a critical struggle for airlines for decades. Yeah, it was interesting. So if you look at the outlook here, Jared, so adjusted earnings are going to be six to seven a share this year. Uh, company did have a profit target of more than seven a share, and consensus was like around 650. CEO telling reporters it was prudent, he said, to adjust the forecast with all the uncertainty, pointed challenges, specifically highlighted inflation and labor costs. Did add, apparently, I'm not giving up on that $7, but Delta was down today. Um, and you looked at other names too, by the way, kind of getting hit because obviously investors start thinking, okay, what does this report mean yeah. for other carriers reporting in the coming weeks? So United got hit, American got hit. One other note though, maybe just worth highlighting here, Delta hasn't been impacted by the grounding of the Boeing 737 MAX 9, uh, doesn't fly that plane. And the mm -hmm. CEO is saying he has no concerns about other Boeing aircraft. I uh, just looking at the heat map here on the Wi-Fi interactive before we move on uh, You were talking about the other airlines in the red for the travel sector It yeah, is a sea of look red there look wind resorts in the in the green But as you pointed out United down 10% and we're gonna get a lot more of these uh, travel earnings coming out in the coming weeks And so we'll uh, we'll keep our finger on the pulse here. All right Finally, let's get a check of United Health Group. Speaking of red, shares under pressure. It's after reporting higher than anticipated medical expenses. This comes even as overall results beat estimates. So this one was interesting. Down in today's trade, this remembers the, the largest U.S. managed care company by market value. First in the group to report. That's why all eyes tend to be on it. And the issue here does sound like that, that it was the company reported higher medical expenses than the street had estimated. Bloomberg noting that the company's medical loss ratio, so how much premium revenue is paid for care, that was worse than expected. The medical loss ratio, 85%. Analysts had figured it was 83%. Yeah, I, I do have some other commentary from the street, just taking a look at Cowan, which rates the stock in outperform with a price target of 605, saying of United, uh, the quarter was a relatively low quality beat, and they're saying that they maintain the 2024 guidance, so that's for this year, but it appears to be reliant on some moderation of medical cost trends, so maybe that's not realistic. JP Morgan also weighing in, they rate the stock in overweight. They say the health cost print that you were talking about here, missed consensus and quote, will likely raise recent and cost trend concerns for the rest of the managed care group. And I think uh, we're seeing that reflected in the Wi-Fi Interactive. If I look at my pharmacy and pharmacy benefits manager heat map here, United, that's the big one. The Kahuna, that's down 3.64%. Humana is down 3%. Yeah, look at that. Uh, and some others, Walgreens, for instance. Walgreens Boost has its own problem. That's down 3%. But, you know, healthcare has picked up over the last two months. But I want to point out, United Health has not benefited from that, so that's another warning right there. Yeah, if you look at the stock, you know, it has not done much um, over the last year, but the vast majority of analysts say, and maybe in part because mm -hmm. of that performance, this one's a buy. 23 buys, three holds, one sell. You can always buy on value. That's so right. That's right. All right, we are just getting started here on Yahoo Finance Live. Coming up, the newest edition of our series, Goodbye or Goodbye. In order to help you make the best decisions for your portfolio, we're going to get analyst insight to break down two of the biggest names in the Magnificent Seven. And on the other side of this break, we're going to turn our attention to Yemen. Following dozens of coordinated strikes against Houthi's rebels, we discuss the latest when Yahoo Finance returns.
Let's turn our attention now to Yemen. The U.S. and U.K. carrying out dozens of strikes against Houthi rebels overnight, attacking ships in the Red Sea, with the White House saying it will not hesitate to take further action if necessary. The action was intended to be a deterrent, but the Houthis have since vowed to retaliate, claiming the U.S. has broken international law. It comes as shipping companies have suspended sailings through the waterway, and already some companies are feeling the effects. Let's bring in Norman Rule, a non-resident senior advisor, CSIS Transnational Threats Project and former senior U.S. intelligence official. Norman, thanks so much for joining us today. We appreciate it. I want to just start, Norman, with, with your reaction and response to this U.S.-U.K. military uh, strikes, Norman. Did you think it was the appropriate response, and how do you think the Houthis now react? Well, good afternoon. The strikes were limited, proportional, and conducted in a manner to avoid civilian casualties. They came after multiple warnings, a UN resolution authorizing defensive actions, multiple defensive operations against Houthi attacks against civilian and military vessels, and also took place after multiple direct attacks on US and partner shipping. They were clearly an appropriate response in a defensive environment, to, for not on our personnel, but for the international economy. In terms of how the Houthis will respond, their, their capabilities have been degraded. There's a report that they fired a missile at a Russian ship that had its uh, um, uh, automatic identification indicator turned off southeast of, of Aden. Uh, but it, these attacks have posed no consequences on the Houthi leadership. And indeed, the attacks could have boosted their domestic prestige. We should expect the attacks to continue, albeit in an opportunistic way and not in a way that threatens a regional war. And, and do you think, Norman, one opinion I've heard, I want to get your take on this, is that the Houthis might relent because, and this is the thinking, they, they obviously are fighting this civil war in Yemen, and so, Norman, they wouldn't want to also be fighting the U.S., the U.K., and allies. It would make them too, too vulnerable to their domestic rivals. What do you think about that argument? There's no evidence for that, and considerable evidence to say the opposite. Within Yemen, the Palestinian cause is popular. There have been pro-Palestinian, pro-Palestine, anti-American demonstrations today. The Houthis seek to enhance their regional stature, and by an undertaking these actions and surviving, they're demonstrating that they have stood up to the United States and Israel. And I should remind your viewers that the Houthi flag and motto is curse the Jews, death to Israel, death to the United States. So they're pretty clear as to their motivations. Yeah, that, that, that's clear in terms of their, their purpose and strategy there, Norman. But if they continue attacking, I guess my question is, Norman, if they continue attacking, even on a limited basis, going after merchant ships, our U.S. naval assets, shutting down the Red Sea, that has just this enormous implications, Norman, for global trade. It's beginning to hit um, specific companies. I'm sure you saw the news from Tesla today. That doesn't sound tenable. What would be our next, our next reaction? What, what would you think we would do next? Well, you're absolutely right. And in fact, the United States has urged U.S. flag shipping to stay away from the area in the near term. All major flag carriers uh, not associated with Russia and China have uh, avoided the area. And this has imposed new expenses on all shipping costs worldwide to include shipping costs from China to Los Angeles, which does not transit the Middle East, but involves a higher uh, rate of pay for ships that are available. The United States is facing a choice. Does it continue to just play defense or does it undertake a serious long-term action to, to degrade Houthi missile, drone, naval mind, and explosive boat capabilities? We shouldn't underestimate the amount of resources or commitment required to do that, but the alternative is asking ourselves, what is victory? Is victory just maintaining a long-term presence and catching every drone and missile they fire? There will be a lot of those. And Norman, is the real issue here, though, we can talk about degrading the Houthis, but we, the real issue is Iran, right? I mean, these are all Iranian proxies, Houthis, Hamas, Hezbollah. I mean, is, is that the real issue? Unless you're, you're really taking on Iran more directly, are you really dealing with the issue? Well, you're absolutely correct. Iran is universally understood to be the enabler of all regional violence, to include the October 7th massacre against Israel. And this violence now touches the global economy. However, it's paid no price. The Biden administration has made no mention of uh, Iran in its statement on the conflict. So in essence, the current state of play gives Iran everything you would want if you were a revisionist aggressor, influence over and damage of your adversaries without any cost. The international community shows no appetite for expanding this conflict into actions on Iran. 
And, and Norman, I want to ask you this, too. As I understand it, it was Trump that designated the Houthis a, a terrorist group. It was Biden that reversed that. In your opinion, Norman, was that a policy mistake? Well, I think the issue is it's always appropriate to consider diplomatic options. But when diplomatic options become something akin to an ideology or religion, that's an error. And it's, it's not a bad thing to say we offered someone an opportunity to turn the page, but if they didn't take the page, somehow we've now made this our problem and not their problem. The Houthis are behaving like non-state actors and terrorists. They should be designated and treated as such. We should note, however, that doing so may complicate humanitarian deliveries and will complicate some regional diplomacy that has produced a relatively stable ceasefire uh, with Saudi Arabia and the Emirates. Norman, I want to get you out of here on this. There are some lawmakers, I'm sure you saw this, including Democrats, by the way, criticized President Biden, said, listen, he should have, he should have approved these strikes with us, with Congress. Do you agree with that criticism? Well, there is certainly some criticism of this action by individuals on the right and the left, but a couple of points. We haven't declared war on the Houthis. The president is authorized to undertake defensive actions to protect U.S. forces. As long as he notifies Congress within 48 hours, it appears the administration has done just that. And whereas Congress is required to formally declare war, the president may undertake such actions by U.S. law. This is, this is something that politicians and lawyers will argue over. But at the end of the day, the administration did what it was supposed to do. Norman, it was so great to have you here today. Thank you so much for joining the show, giving, giving us and our viewers that time and insight. We appreciate it. You're welcome. Markets are mixed with just about 30 minutes left until the closing bell on Wall Street. And for bonds, we're seeing the 10-year hover near 4%. We saw some big swings earlier in the session on the heels of that softer than expected reading on wholesale inflation earlier this morning. Joining us now is Andre Skiba. He is the RBC Global Asset Management Head of U.S. Fixed Income. And thank you for joining us today. Um, we've seen Let's just begin with uh, the 10-year. Uh, we saw that top out at about 5% late last year. We had this incredible rally in bonds that led the yield to dip below 4%. We saw this everything rally in stocks on the back of that. Where are we uh, with regard to that trend right now? Well, thanks for having me. Um, yes, you have a lot of investors who have been astonished at the pace of the rally in the last eight weeks of the year and trying to make sense of what next steps to take. Uh, in our opinion, we have moved uh, a long way, so some consolidation is warranted, and that is exactly uh, what we're experiencing over the recent sessions uh, when it comes to U.S. Treasuries, uh, but also credit markets broadly. Well, and we just got some big bank earnings uh, today, and I bring that up because the uh, big money center banks are bringing, are going to be offering or selling about $25 billion worth of debt this month alone. Uh, we got a lot of other supply coming online. What are the opportunities for investors here in uh, both investment grade and high yield? Well, when you look at the high grade universe, it's pretty clear that financials, uh, so bank uh, debt, has lagged non financials uh, significantly over the recent quarters. So uh, we are looking at uh, a spread differential, a yield differential between those two segments close to historic wides. So, with the exception of the turmoil, that we have experienced in the spring of 23 with the regional bank crisis, uh, financials have not been this cheap compared to non-financials in fixed income markets. And uh, we know for sure that there are a lot of fixed income investors uh, awaiting uh, the issuance of a uh, significant amount of supply uh, in the coming sessions uh, as banks report earnings, that could be an opportunity for those investors who missed a bit of the party uh, in the back end of last year to add to exposure to uh, this segment of fixed income universe that looks uh, particularly attractive. And, and more broadly, Andre, as we, as we start this new year in 2024, what are, what are the returns you think bond investors can generally expect? Uh, 
We are quite constructive in terms of the outlook for total returns in U.S. fixed income. Whether you're looking at high grade or high yield, uh, we see uh, a strong likelihood of high single digit to maybe even double digit returns within uh, the asset class. All you need to see uh, is some marginal uh, spread compression, uh, a little bit of a rate rally uh, over the coming uh, 12 months, uh, and investors taking advantage of the substantial carry of the substantial yield that is on offer. So uh, after a strong year of returns in 2023, we do believe this could well be repeated in 2024, helping to erase some of the painful memories fixed income investors uh, experienced in 2022. Yes, uh, we witnessed that firsthand here as we we're covering that. Um, I want to ask you about the Fed here. The uh, Fed itself, FOMC members who are filling out their forms for the SEP, they believe they're going to be, well, you don't want to necessarily want to call a projection, but they're looking for three rate cuts next year. That's, um, uh, that's what they wrote down on their cards. But the market is pricing in six rate cuts. And the disconnect I think uh, I'm having and a lot of investors are having is that when you get to six rate cuts, that's almost getting into recession territory, uh, needing to get from behind that eight ball. Where do you see the Fed landing this year? I think you're spot on. Uh, in our opinion, uh, market has got uh, a little bit ahead of itself in terms of pricing 150 basis points of cuts between now and the end of the year. We do think rate cuts are coming. Uh, we do think uh, they will be substantial, however, less than is currently priced by the market and also starting uh, perhaps a bit later than initially uh, priced in. Like right now, uh, market is pricing over 70% probability of a March uh, rate cut. We think investors might have to wait a little bit longer, but those rate cuts are coming in our opinion. All right, we're gonna have to leave it there, but really a thank, uh, appreciate your insights there. Thank you for that, Andre. Thank you very much, all the best. You bet, and coming up next, the newest edition of our series, Goodbye or Goodbye. We're gonna be joined by an expert to break down two of the biggest names in tech and help you make the best decisions for your portfolio. Stay tuned.
It is a big, noisy universe of stocks out there. Welcome to Goodbye or Goodbye. Our goal, to help cut through that noise and navigate the best moves for your portfolio. Today, we're diving into the Magnificent Seven, and while the mega cap effect powered last year's returns for markets, with a new year comes a new perspective. So what's the best way to play it now? I am here with Ray Wang. He is a Constellation Research founder and principal analyst. And Ray, your buy on, is, is on Amazon, first of all. Give that away. And then you have a couple of reasons to support your claim. Um, what is your bullish case here? Yeah, my bull case is because the run-up isn't in on Amazon, but we're looking at Amazon versus Microsoft. And when you think about what's going on here, right, Amazon has been doing amazing. And the first one is really, they're done making the investment, right? They've done, you know, 200 billion of investments. If you look at that, you're gonna see the ability for them to actually put that free cash flow to use, not just only in profits, acquisitions, uh, reinvestment, but more importantly, you're gonna see that in profits. All and right. you're gonna see that in the I numbers. wanna hold it right there because I actually have a chart of free cash flow. This is um, the actual, in cyan here versus the estimate. This goes back to 2014, so about 10 years. You can see the estimates got a little bit out of uh, touch with reality, came down, they met reality, it went below, and now it's off to the moon. So this is kind of what you're talking about here. Exactly, and that's where we're gonna see a lot of those gains. Okay, great. Um, we also have as another potential risk here, uh, or excuse me, another potential bullish risk, uh, most diversified streams of digital monetization. So they're finally going down that path, uh, monetizing more in different ways. Can you tell us how? Well, so here's the beauty of it, right? It's ads, goods, search, services, memberships, and subscriptions. Well, think about it. The number three player in ads is Amazon. Out of nowhere, five years ago, you wouldn't be talking about Amazon in ads. And of course, we know they're in goods, they're in memberships, subscriptions, and services, and they've done a killer job there. They're the only one of the Magnificent Seven that have all six of those digital monetization models. All right, and we're also taking a look, you are, at AI, and you're just coming from CES. We'll talk about that in another segment, but. AI is the thing over the last year, automation not priced into the base case. How does, uh, how does that work for Amazon? And so here's the interesting point. All the AI that we tend to think about with NVIDIA, with Microsoft, with Google, actually Amazon has a lot of it, not just in AWS, but they're putting it to use in commerce. And if you've ever seen one of their, you know, one of their warehouses, there's a lot going on in the background with automation. That is actually gonna give them more leverage than the, most people are seeing right now. Yeah, easy to forget how big they are in logistics. Uh, anyway, we got to go to some of the risks here, and one of those is regulatory. We've heard the DOJ and antitrust concerns kind of coming up in recent years. What about that front? I'm worried about DOJ. Uh, if we have the same administration going into the next election out of 2025, there's gonna be huge regulatory issues coming out of FTC, DOJ. If we have a change in leadership, then I would take that risk off the table. Right now, I'm betting that the risk off the table, it's like a 50-50, nobody knows where it's gonna head. Yeah, I'd say uh, pretty uh, fair with that. We don't know where that's gonna go. Uh, we got to talk about Microsoft here. One stock to avoid. Are we saying goodbye here? I'm saying goodbye only because the run-up's already been there. For a lot of people that invest in Microsoft, it's been an amazing ride. Satya is an amazing CEO, but here's some of the challenges, right? One of them right now is when you think about it, massive competition in AI. Microsoft started a war with Google last January that they thought they were gonna win because they thought they caught Google flat-footed. The answer is Google kicked back and they kicked back really hard. All right, and we're also taking a look at valuation. You just said pretty much that they run up, they got a lot of price increase last year. Do you think that's it for them? No, there's still a little bit more, and they may be the most valuable company in the world for another five, six months, but at that point, the question is, what's next? And every investor asks this, will they be able to deliver on what's next? All right, and then quality complaints. Where is that coming from? If you've been on a Teams call recently, you know how shoddy that is. If you're asking for more capacity in the Western region, customers are not getting compute capacity. They've done such a good job selling, now they've got to actually focus on delivery. All right, now how do we turn this into the bull case? It looks like monetization is part of the deal with respect to AI. You know, chat, GPT, open AI, all those capabilities, you know, that's where Microsoft is winning. Co-pilots, applications, ability to do it in an office, every person that codes is using it, especially when you're looking at GitHub, they're getting the benefits of that and that speed, and that's where, that's the bull case. All right, so you're telling us here uh, you want to buy Amazon as AI and automation not yet priced into the base case for the stock, and then more free cash flows is on the horizon. And on the other side, you're saying avoid Microsoft amid steep AI 
AI competition and the run-up in valuation already played out on the AI monetization front. Ray Wang, thank you. Stick around. We're going to be hitting more on some of these tech themes and rivalries on the other side of the break, but that's going to do it for the latest installment of Goodbye or Goodbye. Look out for new episodes three times a week at 3.30 p.m. Eastern. It's January and it's cold in New York City. So the Yahoo Finance team is packing up its skis and investing knowledge and heading to the Swiss slopes for the World Economic Forum in Davos. I know what you're thinking, folks. It's colder there in Switzerland, but myself, Julie Hyman, and the Yahoo Finance live team plan to heat things up with some big time interviews with the who's who of global business. The so-called masters of the universe will convene around the theme of rebuilding trust. There's no trust issues here, you can rely on us to ask the most important questions to the world's most high-profile leaders. Is the world more divided than it has ever been before? Is AI really bigger than the internet? Is this year's huge election cycle the risk we've all been missing? Will the bull market in stocks end really badly? You won't miss anything with our wall-to-wall -wall coverage on Yahoo Finance Live and the Yahoo Finance platform from top leaders in the banking, pharma, and crypto sectors to access the world's foremost academics and some policymakers for good measure. We've got you covered. Yahoo Finance's coverage of the World Economic Forum in Davos starts on Tuesday, January 16th. You don't want to miss it.
A busy week for tech as CES 2024 brought to light future forward products and the next generation of innovation. All in a week where big tech names, Microsoft and Apple, battled it out for the title of the most valuable company. We have Ray Wanger, Constellation Research founder and principal analyst here to discuss. Ray, it is good to see you. So you were on the ground at CES, right? You were checking out the latest and greatest tech. What surprised you, Ray? Was there any products, themes, trends that really excited you this year? Well, of course, AI was everywhere. And we've been talking about AI and having that infused. But CES became a car show and propulsion and EV was everything. And so if you were in the West, the brand new convention center out there, all you're seeing were motors and you're seeing vehicles, flying cars, you're seeing like dump trucks, you're seeing combines all powered by EV. Was that a shift, Ray? Has it been that way for a while? Or was this some type of inflection point when it was just cars, cars, cars? I think the inflection point is the mainstream adoption of EV by every manufacturer and of course the pure native EV manufacturers. Mm. Uh, Ray, we, um, we were just talking about Microsoft as a company to potentially avoid when compared to Amazon, uh, but Microsoft also in the news only yesterday crossed Apple in terms of market cap. Um, regardless of how that shakes out, where do you see these two behemoths advancing in the year to come? I think the important point is Microsoft tends to be more on the enterprise side, and they've done a great job powering through the enterprise in terms of getting AI embedded, in terms of actually getting to a younger demographic. You know, at one point, the average age of a Microsoft user was probably 50, but they started buying things like GitHub. They started to buy, you know, more gaming companies, and they drive down their actual, their actually average age of a user went down. And so that actually made them a lot more competitive. Apple, on the other hand, been much more of a consumer play. They've played out the entire consumer line. And, but the challenge with Apple is the fact that they've got to get more into the enterprise. Microsoft has to get more into the consumer. And that's why you have that very interesting battle that's going on right now for the last of the enterprise dollars and the last of the consumer dollars. It's interesting, Ray, because you know, obviously investors very excited about AI. That was a huge theme in 2023. And that excitement obviously helped really supercharge Microsoft stock, right? I mean, really, you can see like, you know, the investment Nadella makes in Microsoft versus how that stock, what, 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 a, what a great deal. Um, I guess the question for Apple, though, is what is their AI story? You hear kind of rumors of this and whispers of this, but what, what do you think is coming there? Well, the interesting thing is Apple has never explicitly had said they have an AI strategy, but we've all experienced what an ambient experience looks like, right? Take a photo, the lighting's off, suddenly it looks better. I mean, we've done with gray sky pictures, every picture now looks blue, right? It's kind of yeah. crazy like that. Um, and so their AI is embedded in the background. They have a lot of it already. It's starting from the chip level all the way down to the user experience. I think they just have to tell the story more if they want to tell that AI You, story. you don't think they're going to put time and effort and money into kind of building out? Those capabilities, maybe we hear, would you not expect maybe a bit some there's some big announcement coming at the the big software show in June? I'm not sure they're going to have a Samsung. The whole world is Galaxy AI kind of AI strategy that was announced at CES. Uh, I think it's it's been here all the time, and I think people are going to see what it means to actually have AI that works versus hey, we're talking about AI. Yeah. Ray, we were talking over the, break, uh, over the break, and you mentioned that the CES has become an auto show, a car show. Um, lots to do in mobility, and we, the advances for AI, of course, it's integrated in every facet, you got to think. Uh, but what, how does this roll out to the public? How does AI become, I guess, uh, more a part of everyday Internet of Thing objects as those become embedded in our lives? Yes, we're seeing it across a couple of fronts. You saw it in energy management. You saw it in the ability to help you as an assistant, help anything from translation to be able to manage your day-to-day -day activities. We see it in smart lighting and smart buildings. They're actually adjusted to your needs. We're seeing it in the health arena as people are quantifying their self and saying, oh yeah, is that, is that a heart murmur? Is that not a heart murmur? Wait, am I allergic to this thing? Right, so we're starting to see that as augmenting humanity. Over time, what we may get to a point, and that's probably 10 to 15 years out, is be more situational awareness. So right now it's augmenting humanity. In the future, it's how do we train the machines to get to the level of precision I want to get to, and then at some point, we're going to get to that full automation that we all are dreaming of. And remember, the automation is only the way you want it, not the way someone else does. The way we're, I'm dreaming of it, right? Yes, okay. the way they're all we're dreaming of it. So. Uh. And Ray, I want to bring it back to Apple real quickly too, because we do have you know earnings on deck coming up here pretty shortly. Um, there's some kind of nervousness creeping into that story. We've seen a series of downgrades on the street, Ray. I think you know, in, obviously some concern maybe from some quarter about weaker iPhone sales, specifically in China. What, what would you expect when they report? So I'm not sure because what we've seen over the last couple of quarters is 
declining revenues, but profits are still increasing. And that's because the services equation of the rationale is actually growing and services a lot more profitable than putting out a piece of hardware. Um, so I would say that we'd probably see those same kind of trends. Uh, but we did supplier checks, and suppliers aren't like that nervous in the sense that they're saying, hey, we're going to see a decrease. And most mostly because we're still in a super cycle. That super cycle that's going on is because, you know, we've got a lot, probably 250 to 260 million more iPhones to move on to 5G, and that's going to take you into the 15 and the 16 cycles. That's a lot of iPhones, plus we haven't ramped up India yet. So even if China shuts down, and China's economy is really, really bad, mm -hmm. right, India's the one that they're hoping to pick up. Ray, I also want to ask you about, about Apple's next big product, the Vision Pro. That's this mixed reality headset, right? Now, some financial analysts we've had on, Ray, they're not that excited for that in the near term. They say, listen, they don't expect that to be a needle mover. It's $3,500, right? It's not going to be a big mainstream hit. How are you thinking about that, near term versus long term potential? Near term, this is the test to see, is there a market for MR, AR, and any of the VR pieces? This spatial computing is the next frontier. Think, limitless screens, right? No keyboards, peripherals. It's just gestures, motion, right? And eye tracking. And that's going to change the way they price it. So the price at 3500 some people are saying that's pretty high, that's the replacement for one of these devices mm. and a screen and the accessories. They see that as the future computing. So this is the first step forward. Are we going to see significant revenue increases based on that device? No, not in the first year. Are we going to see it in three years? We're going to see a bump in three years. In five years, they will have to find the category. Ray, before we go, I just want to draw your attention to a very long-term chart I have on the Wi-Fi Interactive. You can kind of see it in one of these screens here. It goes back to 1990 and it tracks the market cap of Microsoft versus Apple. And I think it tells a couple of compelling stories. So here's Microsoft, shot up in the 90s, got caught up in the tech bubble. And then it was basically a lost decade and a half. It was dead money for 15 years. And a lot of that had to do with the antitrust probe. And so we have all of this coming to a head right now with different companies, where do you see the antitrust uh, movement come, going with some of these companies? And do you think that they will see potentially a lost decade? Well, I think the antitrust made Microsoft humbler. Uh, they gave them the ability to actually be, they were a lot more cautious 10, 15 years ago. And now I think they've got their chutzpah back. They are ready to go into battle for everything, but they do it very human, humanly, right? Uh, you've got Brad Smith on the other end, navigating like the regulatory environment, showing where Microsoft is a force for tech for good. And that's how they've been able to survive through that. Should the election go in terms of a return of the current administration, then what we're going to have is heavily regulatory onslaught. Should we have a change in administration, you'll probably see less so. But both sides are very wary of what's going on with tech and their grip on their populace, as well as their ability to actually set policy. All right, Ray, we got to leave it there. Really appreciate you stopping by for two segments here, Ray Wong. And uh, we'll see you back here again. Hey, thanks for having me here. You bet. Really fun. The Federal Aviation Administration announcing that it will take new actions to increase oversight of the Boeing 737 MAX 9 airplane, including an audit of its production and manufacturing. And let's bring in now Yahoo Finance's Praz Supermanian to discuss all the details here. All right, lay it out for us, Yeah, Jared, Jared, the FAA not messing around here. I remember yeah. a few years ago when they kind of took their time grounding the MAX after those the Lion Air and the Ethiopian Airlines disasters. Donald Trump went on air and actually grounded the, the planes on, uh, uh, in front of the, uh, the cabinet, cabinet. It was like a uh, sort of a thing that never happened before. So anyway, FAA now saying, you know what, we're seeing a lot of problems here with the 737 MAX 9 jet. Martin, uh, Mike Whitaker, the FAA chief, said that the MAX has significant problems and, and there are other manufacturing problems as well. So what they're going to do now is they're going to have more oversight over these things. So first things first, they're going to audit the assembly lines and make sure BA or Boeing is compliant with these approved quality procedures. They're going to monitor in-service events, meaning when the plane is actually in the air, they're going to monitor those flights and give them more scrutiny. And finally, they're going to actually see this quality checks and, and things like that are overseen on uh, uh, post any kind of issue. Uh, in, in, in fact, including if third parties might be involved to actually make sure this happens. So these are some big steps here uh, that FAA is going to do. And also, Boeing going to play ball here saying that, quote, we welcome the FAA's announcement and will cooperate fully and transparently with our regulator. And, and Prash, just to bring it back to investors who are watching, right now as well. How important is the MAX 9 to Boeing? You know, we're looking at their delivery numbers in, in Q4 and uh, over almost 80% of their orders were 737 MAXs, right? So this is a big, this is their big money maker, their volume jet. This is the kind of thing that they, that investors are betting on for the company as a future growth driver because Bo right now they're behind Airbus. Airbus is the A320 is sort of taking over the game in terms of that single, uh, a single aisle narrow body jet. And this is a problem for Boeing, and they need to actually get the MAX back online here. And, and this is not helping them at all.
No chance. Another headache. Proz, thanks so much for that insight. I appreciate it. And coming up here, the closing bell on Wall Street. We're checking in on the latest market moves and the top trending tickers. Stay tuned. We got the closing bell on Wall Street, and let's do a quick check of the markets there. Looks like uh, we have a mixed market. Dow is going to settle down about one-third of a percent. You can see down 115 points. S&P 500 up just barely eight-tenths of a percent. NASDAQ up two-tenths of a percent. And the small caps, Russell 2000, down about 14 basis points. And for the week, it looks like we're going to end in the green. Let me check for the Dow, though. That was potentially a nail-biter here. And we have the five-day total. That is in the green for one-third of a percent this uh, week. And then also taking a look at the sector action, energy leading all day long, real estate and utilities also leaders here. But consumer discretionary, the retail sector, tanking on the chin down 1.22%, Josh. All right, there it is. Meanwhile, let's look at some trending tickers in today's trade as well. Tesla temporarily halting most production out of its Berlin factory for the next two weeks. It's going to Reuters, the EV maker, also slashing starting prices in China for its Model 3 and Model Y vehicles. So, listen, we were talking earlier in the show about this issue, Jerry, these mm -hmm. Iran-backed militants, the Houthis, how they've been disrupting global trade, attacking ships in the Red Sea. And this is, this is an example of the kind of downstream effect we're seeing here because Tesla now telling Reuters, listen, we're going to suspend most production um, at our Model Y plant in Germany near Berlin from January 29th to February 11th, it sounds like. And that's a supplies now shift transport routes due to these attacks. Um, so you're starting to see the kind of ripple effects show up for companies. Yeah, these costs are non-trivial. I was speaking to one analyst. Um, 
just ballpark figure. It costs an extra million dollars to go around the Cape of Africa there uh, to make that alternate route. Uh, and that's just for one super tanker. And so you add that anything getting shipped around the Middle East, Asia to Europe, Europe to Asia, all of that, uh, the costs are just skyrocketing here. And I want to go to the Wi-Fi Interactive, just to show you what's going on with Tesla recently. Um, Tesla really just took a downturn at the end of last year. Uh, it's been down most of these last two, uh, two and a half weeks there. In the broader context, and let me just show you a two-year chart. That's pretty ch sideways choppy action. Here is a five-year chart. Uh, this is just a giant, giant consolidation area, area and uh, we are just about in the middle of it there. So really not a lot to get excited about from a chart perspective. You either got to come down here all the way to support around 150, all the way up here by about 400, and that could take a little while to get to. So uh, anything to add to that? I just like watching you spin those charts. Oh, I was thank just kind of mesmerized there for a second. All right, I appreciate that. <laughs> All right, and it is a busy day for BlackRock, the investment management company announcing it will acquire global infrastructure partners for $12.5 billion. BlackRock, BlackRock also reporting a beat on earnings for the fourth quarter with assets under management. Here is the lead, $10 trillion. I remember my jaw dropping when it was $5 trillion, and that was maybe, what, 2017, 2018? Yep. Hard to remember, but just a behemoth. And by the way, that was uh, their ETF, IBIT, and I think they were ringing the closing bell there. That was one of the the highest volume ETFs of the new spot Bitcoin ETFs that got launched just yesterday. And so that, that's one big number. And then obviously, obviously, this big acquisition made a lot of headlines too today. So they this buying this private equity firm, yes. Jerry, Global Invest in Infrastructure Partners, for about $12.5 billion. Sounds like in cash and stock. So this sounds like Larry Fink kind of just pushing hard into private market investment operations, which he obviously sees as a, as a real potential moneymaker beyond just this sort of passive investment products BlackRock, BlackRock is of course known for. And these guys basically own, they own energy, transportation, they own water and waste companies. And Larry Fink kind of laid out the strategy here saying infrastructure, one of the most exciting long-term investment opportunities, he says, as a number of structural shifts reshape the global economy. So he's placing a big bet there. Yeah, Wall Street seems to like it too. Jeffries, uh, here's a quote for them, uh, calling BlackRock's plan to acquire them uh, transformative. That's a quote there because it's an area BlackRock has been BlackRock has been growing uh, in both organically and inorganically with about 50 billion in existing assets under management. So. Only 50 billion in, the, in this particular category, but just shows the growth potential that we have there. One more quick comment by Citigroup said that BlackRock's earnings beat was primarily driven, driven by lower salary and benefit expenses, which amounted to one and a half billion dollars. So they're also cost cutting, and that just kind of strikes the chord that Wall Street uh, has been striking, which is lower those costs, get that headcount down yep. uh, if you can. Yep. And we got to talk about gold prices. They are rising just a little bit as tensions escalate in the Middle East, while softer U.S. producer price inflation boosts optimism on the path for interest rate cuts. And gold has been interesting for me to watch. Uh, we can pull up a chart on the Wi-Fi Interactive here. I got gold up here one and a half percent today. Let me change this to a line chart so we can see it a little bit better. This goes back five years, and you can see how gold was stuck just trying to get through $2,000 an ounce. It did it by a little bit, but only broke out relatively recently recently, and hasn't really taken that next liftoff step. But from a technical analysis point of view, if you've been consolidating for four years, well, that just, and you break to the upside successfully, that just means that you're going to have that long a continuation potentially. And so 2,500 is a, a big target that some analysts are looking for here. Yeah, so, so it sounds like really kind of two big factors, right, Jared, when you talk about gold here. One, it's this bet on Fed rate cuts. Investors typically want to own the metal in a rate cutting cycle. And then, listen, we're, we're talking about it again. It's it's geopolitical con conflict. I mean, that's that's playing a role here in a well, it's adding support. Yeah, and I have one more chart on the Wi-Fi Interactive to Do be it. indulged here. Do it. This is central banks buying gold. You're talking about geopolitical risk. Well, guess who wants to hedge against that? central banks. And in 2023, they just about tied 2022. Actually, I think the final totals may have pushed that a little bit above because that's from the last week of the year. But the point is central banks doubling down, tripling down on their gold buying. All right. Great chart again. Thank you.
All right, earnings season kicking off with big banks posting decent results. Wall Street looking to shake off losses built in the year so far as traders look for the broader rally to continue with more on what investors now are focused on. Let's bring in Zach Hill, Horizon Investments Head of Portfolio Strategy. Zach, it is good to see you. So we got, we got the big banks reporting this morning, Zach, kind of kicking off peak earnings season here. More broadly, when you look at earnings season, Zach, you think it's going to be good news? Is it going to be a, a positive catalyst for the market? Yeah, well, it's great to be with you and really kind of wrapping up what, what's been a you know the first full week of trading because last week, I don't know about you, but to me it felt pretty quiet. Um, we're getting a lot of information over these next few days and weeks, and so you know today's earnings reports from the major financial uh, institutions in the U.S. were, I, I would say, so-so. You know, the results were okay. A lot of idiosyncratic stories, some cost. Um, unexpected costs and some of those some turnaround stories and and broadly speaking you know and it's just one day and so I'm not going to extrapolate from you know one day's price action and just a few names in the s p but you know the reaction that the stocks um, you know saw was was not overly positive and so that is something that we're going to be paying quite a lot of attention to over the next few weeks one of the big trends last year was the incredible meteoric rise of assets in cash, and that would be money market funds. I have a chart on the Wi-Fi Interactive here. Just want to show graphically for the audience how big the flows were. Uh, money market funds, $1.3 trillion here. Bonds a bit less, actually quite a bit less, $276 billion, $100 billion for U.S. equity. But when you take a look, and this is a chart that goes back to 2007, retail cash on the sidelines, ICI retail money market fund, total net assets now. Uh, $2.3 trillion, you add another $3 trillion in invest, uh, institutional money. What is going to happen with all this cash on the sideline, do you think? Yeah, we really do think the theme of 2024 is going to be investors re-engaging with the long-term plan, long-term investment, um, you know, uh, offerings that can power their financial plan. And so, you know, I, I think that's something that we're going to be talking uh, with our, we are talking with our clients about, and certainly as people, you know, get their year-end statements over the next few weeks and see, you know, 20 plus percent uh, returns in, you know, broad stocks and, you know, about 4% or so returns in, in cash, I do think that might, you know, induce some action. And so, that, that's that's a conversation we continue to have, and and if we had to rank order, we would say you know stocks over bonds over cash in 2024. And, and Zach, I want to talk Fed here for for a minute with you as well, because we did hear from central bankers this week. Zach, uh, Cleveland President Loretta Mester. Now she was out there saying maybe March is too soon to, to think about rate cutting. You know, suggesting listen, there's more work to do to get back to that two percent target. Interest, Zach, to just get your your take on the Fed. You know, how many? You know, when do you think they're going to start cutting, and by how much? Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of debate about this in the market. Um, you know, and we've seen some pretty whippy price action in in rate expectations for 2024 just over the last week and a half. Um, I think kind of the broad story for us is you know the Fed and specifically Powell, and Powell is definitely the one that we're watching on this. He thinks interest rates are too high. What has happened over the last six months is inflation has fallen faster than pretty much everybody expected. Um, you know that in, t in the in the reports that we saw this week, uh, CPI and and PPI, they further reinforce that that broad trend. And so we do think the Fed uh, realizes that now, you know, interest rates are too restrictive. Um, and what we've seen over the last couple of weeks is just some back and forth in terms of the way that they've been trying to manage market expectations. And, and the reason for that is, you know, look, we've had a, a market that's really been eager to trade peak interest rates for the better part of the last two years. Um, you know, I, people have been talking about when's the Fed going to cut. We've always been pricing interest rate cuts for, for quite a long time, even when the Fed was in a hiking cycle. Um, and so what I think the Fed realizes is they can't open up the floodgates and say, yes, we're going to cut, you know, in March because if they do that, they're worried that the, the market's going to run ahead of them. And so I do think we have this little back and forth in terms of kind of how the Fed is messaging in the near term. But for us, you know, kind of bigger picture, we're listening to Powell and Powell said they're going to be cutting rates very soon. And so that's, you know, I think we think it's going to happen um, at the March meeting and um, they're about six and a half cuts price this year. That seems roughly fair to us, but there's certainly possibilities. If we start to see an inflation undershoot, the Fed's models are going to tell them they need to cut rates even further. And so, you know, we do think that this is a kind of a year where those policy headwinds really start to turn into material tailwinds for the market. All right. Well, let's think about some other headwinds potentially for the markets. Uh, everybody's looking at interest rates from the Fed. But what are some of the things that might be keeping you up at night that might not necessarily be necessarily be on every investor's radar? Yeah, this is a great question, and it's one that we think about a lot in terms of kind of 
you know, uh, scenario planning for what do we really, what are we really worried about and what are we not worried about? Um, you know, and I'd say the biggest thing that we're, that we're focused on from an overall macro uh, economy and market uh, perspective is, is the job market in the U.S. You know, I think put simply, as we sit here today uh, in the economy in 2024, it is very hard to have a proper recession um, unless you see material job losses. And so that's something that we're looking at quite a lot. Um, you know, and so far everything looks good, but we're, we're, we're updating those as we get, you know, weekly numbers from the jobless claims and continuing claims numbers. You know, some of the other things that, that we're thinking about, I mean, definitely noticed that consumer sentiment is really down in the dumps. Um, you know, there's, a, there's not a lot of good reasons for that if you look objectively, um, but it is what it is. That's how people are, are answering their surveys and that's, that's the way that they feel. Um, and, you know, there's, there's a potential uh, situation where, you know, people, the way people feel about uh, the economy can kind of feed into their actual consumption um, actions. That hasn't happened at this point, but that's something that we're, that we're certainly paying attention to. And I'd say the last thing kind of on our, on our radar is just, you know, looking beyond the U.S. for, for different growth engines. I mean, and we haven't had a very strong recovery in Europe. Uh, the recovery in, in China, if you can even call it that, has been extraordinarily disappointing. There are a lot of deep problems there. And so as we think about kind of what's going to drive global growth in 2024, we think it's mostly focused focused in the U.S., and so that makes, you know, the U.S. labor market all the more uh, important, but it also, you know, raises the risk if something kind of goes wrong, there aren't as many other horses to pick up the slack, so to speak. And so those are kind of the things that we're thinking about, you know, right now, obviously exogenous events uh, notwithstanding. And Zach, I want to get you out of here on this. So you sort of highlighted, you know, the, the risk to think about, Zach, but you sounded, you know, generally positive on the U.S. equity market this year, Zach. Where in that market uh, do you see opportunity? You know, is it, is it growth? Is it small caps? Where are you looking? Yeah, this is a great question. There's a lot of debate, too. I mean, I think the, the general thought is we had a super top heavy market in, in 2023. Um, you know, really, if you didn't own those seven names, you did not participate nearly as much uh, in, in the market, in the returns that the S&P delivered. And so there's this thought that now we're going to have to see this broadening out. And, you know, as the we as we look at it, even if we're going to see a, a continued economic strength, which we think we are, um, it isn't doesn't necessarily follow that um, the market's going to broaden out that much. I mean, you know, the part of the reason that, that um, the, the Magnificent Seven did so well last Last year is they out earned everybody else in a really material fashion. You actually had multiples, you know, fall the most for that part of the market as they grew into, um, you know, those valuations. And so that, that's something that we're watching quite a lot in this earnings season as we look forward. But broadly speaking, I mean, you know, we want to be uh, focused on where the where the innovation and the change is happening in the economy. And a lot of that, um, for better or worse, is in the large cap, you know, U.S. Uh, growth and quality parts of the market. And so, you know, we do. Think Think that's going to be um, a place that you are not going to want to you know, just because it did really well last year doesn't mean you're going to want to rotate out of it this year. Um, and so that's that's something that we're definitely looking for, and it's going to be a key focus for us. Um, I do think, though, you know, kind of wrapping it up here, we're not going to see as big a performance spreads as we saw last year. Um, that was just very extreme in terms of what we saw with interest rates and what we saw with the introduction of a new theme. And so we do think there are going to be some opportunities in, in kind of the leftover parts of the market. And, you know, recently we've been in small caps uh, in the U.S. because we thought that's a, a very attractive place. But, you know, as, as that performance gap is closed and as we get into earnings season, we're going to be paying quite a lot of attention because, you know, those, those kind of valuation tailwinds that were there and the positioning tailwinds that were there, um, have changed pretty materially over the last two months. Zach, thank you so much for joining the show today. Really appreciate your time, your insight, and your guidance there. Have a great weekend. You too. Coming up, City, the latest to announce layoffs as major corporations are looking to restructure. So could more be coming? We're going to speak into LinkedIn's senior economist on the other side. Stick around.
Welcome back to Yahoo Finance. We are looking back at the week that was for the markets. And this is a photo finish we had today, but let me show you another one. Here's the Russell 2000 for the week. Uh, looks like it's going to end up down about 14 basis points, but the S&P 500 in the green for about eight tenths of, well, this is actually one day's price action. Let's make the five day 1.84% and the Dow just barely in the green here. But I want to focus on Tokyo. Over in Japan, the Nikkei, it's taken about 34, 35,000 years to get to 35,000. Last time they saw this price in the late 1980s, 89, uh, that was a different era. That, they went through an incredible bubble and bust, not dissimilar with what we saw uh, 10 years later with the tech trade here, but nevertheless, they're getting back up there. Uh, not a new high just yet. So let's take a look at the sector action for the week. And if you thought it was last year, you'd be forgiven because guess what? Tech is number one. That tacked on another 4.4% followed by communication services that houses Alpha and uh, Meta as well. Those were the two outperformers, Staples, healthcare, discretionary real estate and industrials also in the green. To the downside, energy, not a lot of love for energy despite rising tensions around the Red Sea. That was down 2.4%. And utilities, one of last week's winners is one of this, this week's biggest losers. And uh, the defensive structure that we saw last week, well, maybe that was just because it was the four illiquid first days of the year. Uh, nevertheless, here's another look at the mega cap inside the NASDAQ 100. Look at this. NVIDIA just really popped to the upside another 11.4 percent to its total. Amazon up six and a half percent. Meta right there with it. Alphabet five percent. And the software industry looking really strong this year and also the semiconductor. We look at NVIDIA, but also some big gains from AMD there, Josh. Jared, thank you for that. Meanwhile, Citigroup announced it will cut 20,000 jobs as part of a dramatic restructuring to try to turn around the company and bolster the bank's stock. It's the latest in a string of corporations making cuts this week from nearly 1,000 jobs at Google, hundreds at Amazon, and today, Universal Music. It's given us flashbacks to 2023 and the year of efficiency coined, of course, by Meta's Mark Zuckerberg. But what does this trend say about the health of the economy? Let's ask LinkedIn's senior economist, Corey Kentenga. Corey, it's good to see you. So these headlines keep coming, Corey. So Citi and Google and Amazon, I don't know. Should we, should we get nervous here, Corey? Well, there's two things we need to keep in mind when we see these headlines about layoffs. One, like a lot of things in the U.S. economy, layoffs are seasonal. They primarily happen in January. In the information sector, according to the Bureau of Labor Statistics data, and the information sector is very tech heavy. That's also something to remember. So this tech heavy information sector, the layoff rate's about 50% higher in January than any month during the year. So layoffs are seasonal. It's not surprising to see a lot of layoff announcements in January. The second thing to keep in mind is that overall, when we look at the data, both at LinkedIn and the Bureau of Labor Statistics, the labor market seems pretty steady and stable. We're seeing that hiring is actually up in December, and we've seen the lowest decrease compared to last year in December and LinkedIn data than we've seen in over 12 months. We've also seen a lot of action reshuffling in the media industry uh, broadly. We've seen mergers and acquisitions, and of course, layoffs are part of that. What have we seen inside media? So in media, actually from December, we're seeing media is actually one of the weaker sectors that we've seen. But in general, media tends to not be too extreme in terms of being down way, way down year over year compared to tech, to places like tech professional services. So media is down in December, but there aren't really any signs that media is doing particularly poorly compared to other sectors. Corey, can I go back to tech for a second? I want to bounce one kind of argument I've heard about that. And the argument goes like this. It's that of these big tech names, they've been putting a lot of time and money and effort into AI, Corey. Meanwhile, of course, they don't really expect to generate meaningful revenue off AI for some time. So to preserve margins, so the argument goes, they're laying off folks. What do you, what do you make of that? Does that sound reasonable to you? So in tech, we're actually seeing the labor market stabilize. Hiring in tech is actually up about 12% compared to July. 
So we did see a big correction in tech in the last year and a half. They went on a hiring spree during the great reshuffle. So they've definitely adjusted. They've tried to adjust their hiring needs, adjust the size of their labor force. But we, we're starting to see tech is still hiring. And we hear a lot of headlines about really big companies. But what we've seen at LinkedIn is that it's really been a lot of small companies in tech that's, that have kept that sector going. Small companies have been out hiring a bit more than larger companies as of late. So. Tech is still going in terms of hiring. We have seen places adjust their hiring needs, but tech is continuing to start to hire again. And as I said, tech is up about 12% in terms of their pace of hiring uh, in December compared to July. You know, I, I imagine at LinkedIn, you have quite the window into the United States job market. Uh, any special insights, anything that stands out that you might have seen in a survey, searches, things people are looking for, just anything that might be particular to uh, your company's uh, offerings, your, your platform? So you mentioned AI. So we actually have surveyed executives about AI. What are their plans? Do they plan to reduce headcount? What changes are they going to make? We actually see there aren't really a lot of folks saying that they're going to change their headcount or make massive reductions as a result of AI. Lots of folks are excited about it, but there aren't really any many changes on the horizon. Only about 4% of execs said they plan headcount reductions. What we do see, however, is that for job seekers, they're actually very interested to know what companies' AI strategies are. So if you're a company that's listing, talking about AI in the job description, whether or not the job is AI, you're more likely to get views from members. So members are interested. It's a big hot topic right now. They want to know what companies are doing and how that will affect them if they decide to join. And Corey, you know, you're an economist, so just beyond just uh, LinkedIn, your company, I'm interested to get kind of your broader take on the U.S. labor market. It looks sturdy right now, Corey, you know, sub 4% unemployment, wage growth, strong. How do you see kind of the labor market evolving over 2024? So right now, the labor market is steady. We've posted solid job payroll growth. We've also have unemployment below 4%, but the jobs report also shows certain vulnerabilities, right? There's wage growth, for example, to look at. We're not seeing much growth in labor supply. That makes it harder to contain wage growth, and that's an important piece of the puzzle from the Fed's perspective for getting inflation down to their 2% target. So we, all, we see some vulnerabilities in the jobs report. We also see some solid numbers in the jobs report. So it's just something we need to keep an eye on. Going forward, we do expect the labor market to be steady for the first half of the year. If we start to see Fed cuts happening in the summer or possibly earlier, as early as March, we could see a little bit more momentum, momentum injected into the labor market. But right now, there isn't really any shoe that's about to drop for the labor market that we can see in the six months ahead. All right. So real quick then, uh, what do you expect the Fed to do this year if not cutting in March? Do you see them cutting later on in the year? I would expect to see the Fed cut rates at least by the summer, partly because they really want to get ahead of the curve. There's probably some tightening still in the pipeline coming from the Federal Reserve. So they're going to want to get ahead of the curve and start to relax some of that tightening that's already been injected in the economy that hasn't quite come to peak yet. All right. Really appreciate uh, what you have to say here. Corey Kentanga, thank you. Thank you. And coming up, oil prices higher today as tensions in the Red Sea escalated. We've got the latest on the other side of the break.
Oil surged today as tensions in the Red Sea escalated following attacks by the U.S. and its allies against Yemeni sites controlled by Iran-backed Houthi rebels. Brent and crude oil prices rose as much as 3 percent at session highs today. And S. Foray has been closely, closely following this. And Anae, and S., what are some of the details here? Yeah, Jared. So today we saw Brent crude oil go higher. We also saw WTI go as high as 4 percent during the session after the U.S. had announced that the U.S. with its allies had done strikes on some uh, sites, some Yemeni sites that were con that are controlled by Houthi rebels in retaliation for Houthi rebels uh, having uh, attacked vessels in the Red Sea area. Of course, we've been hearing about this tension in the Red Sea for weeks now, and we have seen oil on a daily basis. It can go up 2 or 3 percent. But we did see today that oil then faded, so we did see that uh, WTI closed the session roughly 1% higher. You've got Brent crude that uh, closed the session uh, up 1%, just north of $78 per barrel. But Brent had gone up north of $80 per barrel during the session today. WTI had gone up above $75 per barrel. In fact, I'm going to pull up a two-month chart here so you can see the tight range that we've been trading in uh, throughout January uh, as these escalations have taken place. What's different now is that there was a shipping advisory uh, uh, that uh, advisor that had noted that uh, ships uh, or cargo uh, ships, vessels have now been advised to stay away from this area. We have seen shipping giants that voluntarily have stayed away. Uh, they are rerouting along the Cape of Africa. Uh, but today we saw a, a giant oil tanker firm that said that they would be uh, avoiding the area and they own about 80 vessels that carry refined products, refined energy products from the refineries to the customers. So uh, tankers are definitely staying clear of the area now and that's uh, creating concerns uh, in, in the markets. But the real concern is when you talk to analysts is, is that this could escalate into something greater, into something greater between the U.S. and Iran and, and interrupt Iran's oil supply because Iran uh, produces almost 3 million barrels of oil per day. One analyst telling me if you took that off the market, you could see oil shooting up by about $30 uh, dollars per barrel. Uh, so right now we are seeing also freight costs that are going higher, of course, because this trip that they have to now take along the Cape of Africa takes about 7 to 14 days longer, guys. And as a big, important story, thanks so much for bringing that to us. Thank you. Just before the U.S. strikes in the Red Sea, the World Bank issued a warning that the Houthi attacks were having an impact on shipping routes and supply chains, likely leading to inflationary bottlenecks. This, of course, does not come as good news. The White House, if voters start to see prices rise at the pumps and elsewhere, making last night's strikes as much of a military fight as it is one with inflation overall. That's the take from Yahoo Finance's very own Rick Newman. Rick. Hi, guys. Yeah, I, I'm not saying that uh, Biden ordered these strikes solely to keep inflation under control, but it's certainly a component of what he has to be thinking about. I mean, we all know uh, the Biden administration has been shell-shocked by inflation that came out of nowhere in 22, uh, 2022 and 2023, uh, and uh, Biden's approval rating sank in direct correlation to rising inflation. The problem is Inflation has improved by quite a lot, but Biden's Biden's approval rating has not gone back up. So they are attuned to anything that can be inflationary. And these Houthi attacks on the commercial ships in the Red Sea is definitely inflationary. As, as Inez pointed out, uh, ships that have to go, that are deciding to take a detour around uh, Africa, around the bottom of Africa, uh, that adds a lot of time and a lot of cost. Uh, Biden said yesterday that something like 2,000 ships have already diverted away from that shortcut through the Red Sea and the Suez Canal. So that's just adding a lot of cost. We've seen shipping rates going up for uh, not across, not everywhere, but for uh, for ships going through the Red Sea and the Suez Canal, uh, shipping rates have skyrocketed. So that is gonna get passed on to consumers. So, so the big question for, for markets now is what happens next? Will these strikes against the Houthis, will these did they, you know, did they get all the areas where they've been launching missiles? Did they get the weapons they've been launching? Did they impair their ability to fire more of these weapons at commercial ships? Or are the Houthis just going to come back and do it again? And then are we going to have ongoing tit for tat between 
the U.S. and U.K. forces that are attacking these Houthi sites and the Houthis. And of course, the big concern is, does this escalate further into something that involves, involves Iran directly? I think it's encouraging that oil prices only went up by 1% in the 24 hours or so since we got this news. So traders are basically saying, we think this con is contained for now, but there are a lot of directions this could go and it's day by day. All right, Rick, we got to leave it there, but uh, thank you for that. And we have a new leader atop the world's most valuable company list as Microsoft overtakes Apple. And we're talking about $2.8 trillion here. They've been neck and neck over the last day. And uh, I guess you could say this was somewhat predictable. We've had we've heard about problems with Apple. Mm -hmm. Apple suffered a, a significant, well, I don't want to call it significant, but they suffered a share price drop last year as growth for the iPhone was under uh, concern. It was a cost for concern here. Four quarters in a row of slowing growth. So. You know, Microsoft has edged out Apple once again. They've traded place a number of times over the years. Yeah, Apple is really interesting here, Jared, because they've suffered sort of these series of ground downgrades heading into this print, and you hear these concerns. It's about the iPhone franchise. It's about China, which is mm -hmm. weak, which of course is a very important market for Apple. I do think also part of this is the AI story. I mean, investors are very excited about AI. That's where the puck seems to be going. There are questions about what AI story Apple's going to tell. The kind of rumors and reports about that, I think that's a big issue as well. Now, we don't want to overstate this case either because, yeah. listen, most analysts on the street, by far, rate Apple a buy. They like the predictability. They like that fortress balance sheet, the capital return program. Warren Buffett likes yes. it. That's a selling point. So it, it makes up, sets it up for a very interesting print from these guys. Yeah, and uh, Apple's been under pressure before. I, I showed this chart earlier in the show. I want to show it again on the Wi-Fi Interactive, which is just the Apple versus Microsoft market cap going back to the late 1980s and how Microsoft just by far and away become this, became this stalwart into the year 2000. And guess what? 1997, 1998, that's when Steve Jobs came back to Apple and Apple started its comeback and finally overcame. Apple was the biggest company in the world by 2013. It overtook Exxon yeah. of all companies. Uh, that has been a leader for years, if not decades, in and out there. But, uh, Mike, but Apple finally overtook. And then Microsoft, it was only 2016, 2017 that they surpassed their dot com market cap from 16, 17 years ago. So it's just been an incredible ongoing saga here. All right. No, it's a great it's a great battle to watch. Top market cap. Yes. Who gets the crown? Yeah. That's it. I like it. All right. Coming up, what to watch tomorrow. We break down the stories you need to know to start your day. It's January and it's cold in New York City. So the Yahoo Finance team is packing up its skis and investing knowledge and heading to the Swiss slopes for the World Economic Forum in Davos. I know what you're thinking, folks. It's colder there in Switzerland, but myself, Julie Hyman, and the Yahoo Finance Live team plan to heat things up with some big-time interviews with the who's who of global business. The so-called Masters of the Universe will convene around the theme of rebuilding trust. There's no trust issues here. You can rely on us to ask the most important questions to the world's most high-profile leaders. Is the world more divided than it has ever been before? Is AI really bigger than the Internet? Is this year's huge election cycle the risk we've all been missing? Will the bull market in stocks end really badly? You won't miss anything with our wall-to-wall -wall coverage on Yahoo Finance Live and the Yahoo Finance platform, from top leaders in the banking, pharma, and crypto sectors to access the world's foremost academics and some policymakers for good measure. We've got you covered. Yahoo Finance's coverage of the World Economic Forum in Davos starts on Tuesday, January 16th. You don't want to miss it. Skydance reportedly exploring an all-cash bid that would give it control of Paramount. The production company led by David Ellison and its investors looking to buy a majority stake in National Amusements, that is a parent company of Paramount. For more on the potential deal and the media landscape that we're seeing in 2024, we're turning to Matt Baloney, Puck founding partner and entertainment journalist. Thank you for joining us here today, Matt. Um, let me just get your big picture view. We've seen media get shaken up on a periodic basis. It's almost like a cycle. I don't want to say you could set your watch to it, but we've seen a lot of uh, people over the years. What did these latest moves signify? Well, I think we're entering a year of retrenchment and consolidation in the entertainment industry. There's been an incredible run-up over the past decade as streaming video 
has challenged linear television as the dominant delivery mechanism. And when both were thriving, we had a very robust economic ecosystem for content. Now we're seeing the linear television market really declining faster than anyone thought. And the streaming video landscape has not been profitable for any companies besides Netflix and then the tech companies that don't really need it to be profitable, Apple and Amazon. So we're seeing a huge correction in the content ecosystem in Hollywood right now. Matt, let's take, let's take a, uh, a specific name here. I want to get your take on Paramount Global. I mean, you've seen all the headlines here, Matt. Lot, lots of headlines, lots of personalities. How do you think that shakes out, Matt, in 2024? You know, is, is it Warner Brothers? Is it Skydance? Help us think through it. Yeah, I mean, 20 years ago, Viacom, the former company, was the biggest media company in the world. And slowly over the past 20 years, via the decline of the cable television universe, where Viacom was heavily invested, and the mismanagement of the company, the decline of its founder, Sumner Redstone, it now finds itself as the smallest and least, advent least advantaged of the traditional media companies. And there are now the vultures coming out. The Ellison bid, which is with Redbird Capital, Capital and Tencent, they are looking under the hood right now of Paramount, they're about to, and they're gonna see if it's worth making a bid. They wanna go in through National Amusements because National Amusements has 77% of the voting control of Paramount Global. So they feel that if they get control of National Amusements, then they can get control of Paramount then they can merge it with Skydance, and then they can take the studio and figure out what to do with all those declining cable television assets. But there are others out there too. Warner Discovery has had a talk. I don't think that's gonna really go anywhere because when news of that talk leaked, the stocks of both companies suffered, meaning the market doesn't like that deal. Um, but there may be others out there for Paramount that we don't know, or they may just start selling parts. So, so where does this leave the viewers? Uh, we've seen tremendous changes inside the streaming networks, uh, bundling, unbundling, and uh, all I know is that I'm paying as much for bundles as I used to pay for uh, cable with sports packages. We're looking at $60, $70 a month now. Where does this leave the consumer? Well, right now the friction is really in the streaming world. You can get cheaper cable bundles because they're so desperate and it, people are really challenged their cable companies on that. But there is no real effective streaming bundle that gets you all the services for one price. And I think we're headed that direction, but there's not a lot of incentive for places like Netflix to really do that because they're doing fine on their own. And there's not a lot of incentive for Apple and Amazon to do that because these are not their primary businesses. They make money elsewhere, it's sort of a brand halo. So it's really the legacy companies like Disney and Warner Discovery and Paramount Global, they would like to see a bundle very much. Ultimately, someday you will pay $100 to get your five favorite streaming services plus sports, and that will be a rebundling towards what we had with cable. But we're not there yet. And finally, Matt, I want to get your take on just another name you know so well, which is Disney. A lot going on there as well, Matt, this year. I mean, it's pelts, it's streaming, it's the movie business. There's a lot on Mr. Iger's plate. I'm just interested, what are you watching for Disney, in, for Disney this year? Well, there's sort of three areas. Yes, there's this proxy fight with Nelson Peltz, and now he's recruited Ike Perlmutter, the former head of Marvel, Jay Rusulo, the former CEO of the company. I really don't think that's going to go anywhere. It's more on the business decisions that Iger has to make. He needs to find a way for ESPN to compete for these top tier sports packages, namely the NBA rights, which are coming up right now. And he's out there looking for an investor in ESPN that will allow Disney to keep control of the asset, but give it a boost in looking for uh, these sports rights, which have become outrageously expensive. So that's one area I'm looking at. The second is really the creative engine. Disney's divisions, whether it's Marvel or Pixar or Disney Animation, they've all kind of stumbled at the same time. And you can blame the pandemic, you can blame the chaos in the C-suite with Iger leaving and then coming back, or you can just blame the you know normal ups and downs of the entertainment business. But Iger has to get all of those creative engines refiring. And I think that's where his focus is gonna be for the most part in 2024. 
Matt, loved having you on the show today. Thanks so much for joining us. Really appreciate it. Thanks. Time now for what to watch next week on the earnings front, Goldman Sachs, Morgan Stanley, and PNC picking things back up for the financials. It follows, of course, the mixed bag of results from JP Morgan, Bank of America, Citigroup, and Wells Fargo today. And turning to the economy, we're getting a look into the state of the consumer. Retail sales expected to slightly tick up for December. And we'll also get a reading on consumer sentiment, which is expected to hold steady for January. Later on in the week, on Thursday, we're going to be getting fresh data on the real estate market. Housing starts and building permits are out ahead of the open. And at noon Eastern, we get a weekly look at mortgage rates. And those have been rising for two straight weeks. Finally, on Friday, we'll also be getting a reading on existing home sales. Also, be sure to tune in for Yahoo Finance's coverage at the World Economic Forum's annual conference in Davos, Switzerland. We're going to be hitting on the most important questions with the world's top leaders on the key issues facing the economy. You won't want to miss it. And Jared, here's, yeah. here's my take. All right, what am I watching next week, Jared? Let's do that. Yes. Let's get into this. So we got big banks today. We were talking about that. J.P. Morgan, Citi, Bank of America, Wells Fargo. Mixed reaction from investors. Tuesday, two other big ones, Goldman, Morgan Stanley, also reporting. Earlier in the show, we talked um, with Dave Ellison from Hennessy Funds. Asked him, okay, you heard from the big banks today. Did it tell you anything about what you might see from Goldman yes. and Morgan Stanley? Next week, he sounded generally positive, uh, Jared. Obviously, there are, you know, listen, there's nuances here, but bottom line, his opinion, what we heard today tells us the industry is in decent shape, consumers resilient, the rest of earnings, he told us, Probably okay in his words. Probably okay. I'll take that until yeah, we get that it. big slate of tech <laughs> earnings. I think that's a couple weeks away. I am watching the bond market like a hawk. We've seen the tenure hovering around 10, uh, or excuse me, around 4%. Mm -hmm. And then we have this government shutdown. Yes, another government shutdown looming. Uh, what does that mean? Well, we've seen this. Usually there's some 11th hour uh, motion to kind of uh, skirt any disaster there. And that mm -hmm. tends to happen regularly. But for some reason, we keep getting into this mess a few times per year it seems like so I'll be uh, watching out for that yeah more mess that's what you're more looking mess. for yeah mm -hmm. exactly all right that's going to do it for today's Yahoo Finance live be sure to come back Tuesday at 3 p.m. Eastern for all of your coverage leading up to and after the closing bell Good morning. This is Yahoo Finance. Big news. Three things that you need to know. We just got the announcement. What happens now? I got a question. What does success look like? What was one of the biggest challenges that you faced? How much does that raise the odds for a recession? This phase is over. Tell me what happens to the debt ceiling. Where does generative AI, though, fit into your portfolio? Talk to us about this diversification and what investors need to know. And I think it's important. This is the stuff that gets me out of bed, fired up. What's the gateway? What's the new bridge to opportunity? Doesn't matter if it's a soft landing or a hard landing. Landing. Big, big interview. I, I can't wait. Supreme Court out with the ruling on President Biden's student debt cancellation. Right, let's turn now to some recent tech earnings. And they give you information if you watch them closely. President Vosick, President Investor Gary Gensler, thank you so much. Part of what Davos is about is sharing best practices, coming forward with ideas, and then enabling those ideas into action. And I would add that there's more to come on this. And we keep producing products that help people lead healthier lives. This is one of those rooms they use to simulate light in space. Interest rates will come down again. Figure out where your money is going now. You got to scope that out. And the numbers really tell the story. What does all this mean for you? Keep it tuned into Yahoo Finance. I'm Akiko Fujita here in Las Vegas at CES 2024, where I'm inside the John Deere booth. Joined by Josh Jepson, he is the CFO of the company. We're talking about automated tractors. Not the first thing you think about with John Deere, but certainly this is a company that's undergone incredible transition, especially with your tech investments. Yeah, it's a significant opportunity for, for us to help our farmers do more with less and make their lives easier. You know, there's there's this, a lot of challenges around having the access to skilled labor and also just being able to execute jobs when they need to get them done. So in this example, an autonomous tractor doing tillage work does just that. Okay, so let's set things up here because we've got an iPhone here, right? We're gonna try to operate a tractor that is out in Austin, Texas. Yep, We're right. looking up here because the monitors are there. Yep. How do we get started? This is an app, by the way, that every farmer uses, correct? Yeah, so this is the John Deere Operations Center. Okay. It's, it's really the digital platform for all of their ag 
information as it relates to machine health, agronomy, and the like, but you can control our autonomous tractor here. So we can see it where it's running, you can see stats about it, but if you just push pause, it's running right now. Okay, can and, I go ahead and do that? Yeah. And we watch here, so we see it stopped. Okay. Came to a halt here, and then yep. we press and resume. And then when you press resume, yeah, go ahead. Okay. It'll run through safety checks just to make sure there's nothing around it. And then we'll see the, the tractor take off and start going again. So again, this is about getting jobs done when they need to be done, mm -hmm. job quality, and really hard to quantify, but we'll, we'll, from our farmers that have been using this, it's a huge quality of life advantage. They can be two places at once, so they can be with their family, they can be at sporting events they would have historically missed, or just having dinner with their family or doing other work around the farm that they wouldn't have had access to before. Uh, talk to me a bit about the demand that's out there, because especially in farming, as we were talking off camera, you've got a lot of people that are aging, you've got a lot, not a lot of people that are getting in, right? I mean, there's going to be an increasing shortage in this space. The robotics, increasingly important. Yeah, that, that's right. I mean, you think about the, the work that our farmers doing, it's really critical. We're talking about food and fiber, which is really, really important. Um, there aren't more people necessarily moving into agriculture, which means our machines are gonna have to do more. And the ability to automate and, and, and move to autonomous is a huge unlock for our customers. And we feel like we're really well positioned to do that given how we do all the jobs that our customers do on the farm and our ability to manage all that in a digital platform that makes this all very seamless. So, so far we've we've pressed pause, we've resumed it again, but really, you know, we, we talk so much about autonomous driving on regular roads. You're trying to accomplish a whole nother thing here yep. because farming is not that easy. What other functions can you do remotely? Yeah, certainly, so there's opportunities we, we can, um, adjust settings, like you, we could adjust speed, uh, for okay. example, on this right now. In other machines, like on a combine in the harvesting time of the year, you can actually adjust the key settings to drive better uh, yield okay. through that process. And, and those are all the things we need to do to help our farmers be in more places at, at once and to be able to adjust and make changes to ultimately deliver the best outcomes that they can have. Okay, so let's try, can, can we try to adjust the, the speed here? Yeah, so right there, infield speed, you can go up or down. Okay, we're at 5.1 miles an hour. Let's try to increase it a little. Can we go up to like six? Yeah, probably there's, yeah. Yeah, that seems reasonable. So it pauses once. And now we're going, yep. Okay. Is five miles kind of where you usually yeah. want to keep it? Yeah, in that range, really depending on soil conditions, how wet or dry is it. Um, and you can see down on the display um, that we're seeing here, we're, we're looking at the remote display, but you can see it's going you know, 5.8, 5.9 miles per hour like you, like you adjusted it. Okay, now I'm watching the screen here. It looks like the tractor is going out of the, the square essentially. But, but you have created the, the parameters, right? That's right. So what you see, the, the purple or, or, excuse me, the red or pink line is, is the, the field is geofenced. So it, it will not go outside of those boundaries. Okay. And what you can see, like the white line um, is actually the path. So it's okay. gonna enter a turn um, and, then we'll, and then we'll carry on. What is, um, okay, so let's bring it back down to where it was. Was that like 5.1 5 miles an yeah, hour? Yeah, I think so, yep. And what about some of the other functions that we can use? The turn speed. Yeah, so this is preset turn speed, so it'll always slow down okay. when it's going to do turns. Um, like I said, if we were in a combine, if we were out harvesting right now, and you, know, you, you were the farm manager and I was an operator, and you wanted to check to see how was I doing from a grain quality perspective, you can actually adjust key settings on the combine as well. So what we're seeing is the, 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 the operation center is becoming really the, the central platform to manage the operations, not just looking backwards at results, but also in the, in, the, in the moment, what adjustments do we want to be making in field? What can be done remotely right now, and what's the next step? Yeah, I think, you know, so a lot of adjustments on machines today, um, we all can also can do remote diagnostics. So when we think about how does how do we provide better and better support to the machines, we're monitoring these machines, our dealer network has access, if you so choose. So we can actually identify problems before they create a failure. So doing predictive, proactive maintenance 
ahead of time to say, hey, here's an issue, we're seeing a code, we think in the next three hours we may have an issue, we're gonna send someone out and take care of that today. So uptime is really important, so meaning the machine's up and running when you want it to be running, is we spend a lot of effort making sure customers are running when they need to be, because in agriculture, windows to execute jobs are really, really tight. You've got weather, you've got a lot of other things that are in, in play. And, and I'm no expert in farming, but obviously this is just one step, correct? I mean, what is the thinking in terms of how John Deere wants to expand capability given the multiple steps that are required to harvest, harvest crops? Certainly. So our, we have a goal by 2030 to have, for corn and soybeans, a fully autonomous production system. So that means tillage, like you see here, like you've been controlling, but also moving to planting, to spraying when we protect the crop, and then to harvest. So our intent is we would be fully autonomous for corn and soybeans um, across every job. So that means you're going to need to be able to manage each job and all of those settings across all of those uh, things you're doing. And, and while we're talking about this specifically, being able to operate the tractor remotely. I mean, you're digitizing across the entire stack, correct? Correct. Yeah, so the, the operations center, the John Deere Operations Center is really the a digitized farm. Um, you've, you've taken that so you can monitor, you can look at historical yields, you can look real time how you're executing the field. As we go through, we are actually, if we were planting, you could see that we're geospatially tagging each seed so we know where every seed is. Um, we've got technology over here that is furrow vision. It's actually putting a camera where a farmer's never been able to see before, to see in the furrow when, as you're planting, to understand, you know, are you getting the right seed depth, the right spacing between seeds? Um, so it's really about how are we making these jobs easier for our farmers to execute on and improved outcomes. And we think through uh, the technology that we're delivering and the, the digital aspects, we can deliver better financial outcomes, and better sustainable or environmental outcomes for our farmers. And finally, you know, we were just talking that John Deere is not a name that used to be at CES, right? I mean, now you've become a regular here. The company's talked about being seen now as, as one of the largest robotics companies, equipment uh, manufacturers too. Uh, how much of that goal that you've talked about will involve uh, being more acquisitory, given all the technology you need to bring in house? Yeah, certainly. So, so we've historically been pretty vertically integrated um, and, and we've augmented over the last five or six years in the technology side via acquisition. So we've made uh, a number of acquisitions in, in the Bay Area and Silicon Valley, bringing both technology but also capabilities. And, and I think the, the, the magic for us has been bringing those capabilities and, and integrating that with our experts in our machine forms and with agronomy, uh, which has really been helpful. So I think we'll continue to look to add to our portfolio organically, but also inorganically, where we can see step function changes uh, in, in our ability to deliver solutions. Josh, thank you yeah. so much for talking to us. Yeah, thank you.